Welcome everyone to another episode of Thoughts in History from a Centenarian with Dale Dyer. In this episode, we'll pick back up where we left off from episode 8 at the end of the war and Dale's about to get discharged from the Army Air Corps. His return to Kansas State in Manhattan, Kansas to finish up his degree, his first career job in the field and eventual resignation from that job and return to Blue Ridge with his new wife and son to settle down and work for his father-in-law in the implement business. Hope you enjoy. Welcome back to another episode of Thoughts in History from a Centenarian with Dale Dyer. On this episode, we'll pick up at the end of the war after Dale has come back from overseas from England, and he's already gotten married, and he's down in Amagordo, New Mexico. We were talking about that right before the segment started. You actually had talked about going on to Clovis, New Mexico, but I think we kind of ended it there. So you had some stories about you ferrying crews and planes around from Amagordo, New Mexico. So tell us some about that. Okay, it's good to be back with you, and I hope that I can make it sense out of what <laughs> happened to it at that time. Uh, anyway, Amagordo, New Mexico was a base that, uh, that uh, we were training in flying the B-29, and we'd gotten down there right near the time that the South Pacific uh, engagement with the Japanese had just ceased, and uh, but they, we were still in training and uh, doing almost daily what had been going on for quite some time. But I got an assignment. Uh, evidently, they were retrieving the planes that belonged to our base that had, that had to land at several different bases, so they assigned a bunch of crew members to fly these planes back, and I was assigned to take them to their places and let the crews out. So we left that afternoon, and uh, we flew over to Tucson, Arizona, and let out a crew there and spent the night. The next morning, we took off with the rest of the crews and to for Mountain Home, Idaho, and we flew right over the Grand Canyon, and the fellows says, hey, let's go down and see the Grand Canyon. So I headed down, and we got in the canyon, and we flew 50 miles upstream on the Colorado River and 50 miles back down. We were below the rim of the canyon on both sides, right down where they could really see the canyon, and that they were just excited as could be all of the my passengers you, that I had. You couldn't do that these days, could you? Oh, no. They'd, they'd throw you under the jail. <laughs> You'd be deprived from flying the rest of your life if you tried something like that yeah. today. You could, but, you could probably do it, but you would have to get uh, special permission from the FFA to be able to do it and all. That's right. But anyway, that was quite an enjoyable flight. And then we flew up to the mountain home, Idaho, and let out another crew, and when they took off from that, I'd been flying all the time, and I, I decided to let the co-pilot take it for a while, while we were flying the next crew to Fremont, Nebraska, and uh, so I laid down kind of on the deck, let the engineer sit in my uh, co-pilot seat, and I evidently snoozed off, and all at once, the plane went out from under me, and I I reached out and got a hold of it. About that time, the plane come back up, and I smacked the deck pretty good. And I got up, and I had a headache. And I got up between the the, the two in the, in the the pilot and co-pilot seat. And I looked at the altitude. We were up about sixteen thousand, better than sixteen thousand feet. I said, "What are we doing up here like that?" He says, well, we run into this front, and we was trying to get over top of it, and we couldn't quite make it, and we went through the top of it, and all those fronts, the air goes up in the middle and spills out on the outside, and that uh, up and down draft in that short distance, it smacked us pretty good. And I said, well, to get this thing down, we don't have any oxygen on board. And uh, so we got through the cloud and, uh, and headed back down again. And we landed at Fremont, Nebraska that late that afternoon. 
and uh, we all had terrible headaches that night. Uh, we'd been without what, oxygen. We didn't have any oxygen on board. Uh, the plane's wide open, and we spent the night there at Fremont, let that crew out. The next morning, we took off to fly back to Alamogordo, but uh, Wichita was kind of on the partly uh, out of route, but uh, it wasn't far out, and so I wanted to fly down and fly over my hometown and, and fly over my, where I was raised, and we did, and I got to the near home, and I, I got down to about 500 feet above the ground, and I circled the house a couple of times, and I saw my mother come out with a dish towel, and she was just a-waving it. She knew it must be me, <laughs> and uh, that was kind of exciting. Uh. And so we headed from there on back down to Alamogordo where my wife was, and we were there, and I got to fly uh, the test pilot of all the B-29s down there. He picked me as his assistant to take planes up to check them yeah. out after <clears throat> new motor jobs and all the work that had to be done on different ones. The, we had a trip to... You, California and out over Catalina Islands one evening. Yeah. And uh, those were experiences, uh, great trips. <clears throat> but uh, then we got moved up to uh, Clovis, New Mexico. And uh, while I was up there, I think that's where I had, uh, got to take a, a bunch of colonels and majors up to Denver, Lari Air Base. And uh, they went to a football game. And uh, so... Uh, it was just one thing after another that they signed me. Then I, uh, since the war was over and they started discharging uh, so many of the service personnel, and uh, we ended up at uh, Amarillo, Texas. That's where I was being discharged. And uh, I got to take my wife up flying the first time mm -hmm. in a little Cub airplane that they had there on the base. And... Uh, I had a time talking her into going with me. She wasn't uh, very hept on fire. But she never has been, has she? No, she's not a, a fan. But in the later years, she didn't mind the commercial flying. Right. But these little airplanes, she didn't have much faith in them at all. But uh, we, we had a lot of fun over all of that. From there, after Amarillo, we, I was discharged and... I uh, had a, an uncle out in the panhandle of uh, Oklahoma uh, that had lived out there for most of his life, had homesteaded there, and they had nine boys and one girl in the family. And uh, that was Joe Dyer, my, my dad's brother. And uh, we spent a night with them, but all the boys were often married, or but they were all practically farmers. I think there were one or two of them that was in service. And uh, from there, we, after we spent a night with them, we went back to my home, and we were there for a month or so, uh, recuperating, you might say, and getting to enjoy uh, the being uh, out of service. Anyway, then we decided to come down to Blue Ridge and visit my wife's folks in, I believe, it was November of uh, 45, right after the war, and uh, so we we took off and came down here, and, and uh, uh, they were building the Hampton Motor and Tractor Place. When we got down here, they had the uh, foundation all done, and they had to, uh, they were coming up with block work on the walls and brick work and putting down uh, the subflooring and for the first floor above the basement. And Let me interject something. For those who may not know where that is in Blue Ridge, the building is actually still there, and it's called the Hampton Square, which is on the north end of town. It's a brick building uh, across from Whitener Stone, right? Yes, uh, the Hampton Motor and Tractor. At that time, it's called uh, Hampton Square now. Right. So I didn't know that I would be running that thing shortly after that. But uh, anyway, uh, my one aim at, after I got out of service, and we'd been down here and visited, <clears throat> was to go back to Kansas and go back to Kansas State and finish up and get my degree from college because I was 
liked eight hours of finishing school, uh, getting my degree. All right, Pop. Sorry, but we got interrupted by the phone ringing, and so we had to bring it to an abrupt halt there for a minute. But now we're back, and we're going to pick up where you were talking about uh, your one goal after the war was to get back to college and finish up your degree. So let's pick up there. Uh, you made it back to Manhattan, Kansas to Kansas State University, KSU, and to uh, finish up college. So pick up from there. Yes, uh, that was my desire to get my degree. So in order to finish up and get the right courses, I had to go to the spring uh, session of, and to the summer school to get all of my courses. And if, so I ended up with some master's uh, courses that uh, if I'd wanted to continue on my education. Uh, but anyway, uh, my wife and I, we lived in a, a first an apartment uh, at a, a couple of old maids off the campus there. And we just had a, a two rooms, no bathroom for, for ourselves, but uh, we had to share a bathroom with them. And we were upstairs and we had no refrigerator and, and just a little oil stove. We had an ice box out on the, one of the north windows, and that's where we put our perishables to try to keep them cool. And uh, it was quite an experience for my wife uh, to have to live like that, start out with. Uh, she was a good sport and uh, enjoyed it. She worked in the college post office while we were back at uh, school there, and that was her job, and she made a little money on that. And, of course, I was getting the GI Bill, which we got $115 a month from the GI Bill. And uh, we, were, we were making out, and I'd saved some money uh, the, from some of my flight pay during the war. And uh, so whenever we finished in uh, August of, of 46, I, I finally graduated. My mother and dad came up from Clearwater, Kansas for the graduation, and so that was quite a experience for them. I'm the only one of our family of six that went all the way through college. So uh, anyway, when we finally finished, and, and uh, the jobs that offered uh, they was, for graduates at that time was $200 a month. Uh, that was just standard uh, offer. Uh, but this National Geophysical Company out of Dallas, Texas, offered 225 So I thought, well, I'll just try that. And so I, w I went to work for them as a geologist. Uh, we worked in the field with uh, special equipment and uh, mapping sub uh, sub uh, terranean. Yes, rock formations uh, that oil accumulates underneath of them. And uh, so basically, it, you were lo looking for oil. Yes. Well, we were just showing where pockets possibly would be, where there'd be a dome of impervious rock that uh, would keep the oil from coming to the surface. And uh, they reduced their drilling from a hundred things to get one producing well down to ten uh, using our uh, information. They could get a producing well in ten. In other words, before they would have to drill yes. upwards of 100 wells before they actually got one that produced, That's whereas with your information that y'all were getting, they only had to drill maybe 10 wells before they hit oil that would produce, right? Yes. Our first job was uh, West Texas and uh, up around uh, the panhandle of Texas, uh, below the panhandle of Oklahoma, Electra, Texas, and... Uh, we were a field crew observation, and we had to had seismograph equipment that uh, detected dynamite that we would we had drillers that drilled holes and we put dynamite in the hole of a stick of dynamite and then set it off and and the shock wave that went down and that would bounce back like a flashlight shining into a mirror. And the time of that come out on the, uh, the equipment that we had in the observation vehicle that uh, they furnished us. So uh, I was uh, ahead of that thing. And uh, we'd had to leave town at 7 in the morning. And they didn't let us back into town till 
seven at night. We twelve hours. We we had to spend in the field every day, and we went through winter to, in Missouri <laughs> on another assignment, and uh, it got rough that that winter. And that's when my our first son was born in '46, Larry, and uh, we acquired a house trailer, a twenty-seven foot house trailer with. It didn't have a bathroom in it. We had to park someplace where we had a bath facility. We had to have a hose for water, a spigot operate, and uh, the hose would freeze up at night. <laughs> it was a hard time for a young mother having to take care of the diapers and the baby and, and everything. And, and, uh, I bet it was. Live in that house trailer. But, um, we made it, then we finally moved to uh, east of Shreveport, uh, Mississippi, I guess it is. Anyway, we were there one one winter, and we were out in the field every day with our equipment, and was sent back out to West Texas near Electra, uh, West Texas. And that was in the springtime. Uh, we were out have laying out a thousand foot of, of cable on each side of our uh, observation vehicle and having to tie uh, with clips uh, onto this cable uh, seismograph jugs and uh, they would pick up the, the shock wave of these dynamite we had to explode to get the frequency and the depth of what the rock was. Well, they'd signed us out on the place and we found out when they, we were confronted by the manager of the King Ranch out there, a private big property owner, and he told us that we had to turn over all of our records to him or we went to jail and another crew had been there two or three weeks before and they wouldn't turn over the records, and they were in jail up in Electra. And I told them that didn't sound good to us, so I suggested to put all the records in a box, tape it up, if he would accept that and, and give me a receipt for it, and then if the company wanted it, they could come to him to get it. And he says, that's a pr pretty good idea. He says, I'll agree to that. So I decided to right quick to call my father-in-law here in Blue Ridge. And uh, Well, hold on, Pop. Backing up to Mississippi, wasn't that where Larry was born? Minden, Louisiana. Minden, Louisiana. That's where Larry was born. Y'all yeah. were sent out there for a job and everything. But then, owned to West Texas, where you was doing this drilling, uh, exploring for oil and stuff. Did y'all know that you were on private land and didn't have permission from the landowner? We, we, we just went where they told us to go. We didn't have any idea that we were on the King Ranch. We had no indication. Of, nobody had said a thing to us about that. So in other words, they just sent you to this spot and said, you dig here, and they didn't have permission from the landowner to actually be doing this then. Is that correct? Yes. So uh, I, 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 I didn't agree very well with me Yeah. that uh, they would be willing for us to have to go to jail for them trying to get the uh, information off a private property that they, they didn't have any permission to be exploring on. So getting back to what you were fixing to say, you called up your father-in-law and... And uh, he'd told me when we got married back and out in Kansas in 45, says I could use you if you ever need a job. And I didn't think Jen wasn't real happy about coming back to Blue Ridge to, to live. But uh, Well, she... Couldn't have been too happy out there on the road either, living in a little 27-foot trailer, well, that trying was, to take that care was of just her. a new experience for her, uh, growing up, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's a life experience. That, and uh, in a way, it was real hard on her, but she was experiencing something that she was enjoying doing. So really? So uh, she was a good sport about things like that. And... Uh, Anyway, as soon as I called him up, he says, how soon can you get here? <laughs> and uh, I was surprised at that. I told him that we'd leave immediately. And it took us three or four days to get organized, drive all the way back here. And, and pulling that little 27-foot trailer, right? And pulling that trailer, if we got up to 35 miles an hour on the road, it was just about <laughs> dangerous to with that trailer. Now, it did have electric brakes on it, but uh, 
the connection had been broken sometime before we started back here from uh, out in West Texas. And I had to pull the trailer to Dallas uh, over a hundred miles or better to get a place that could fix uh, the connection on the brakes. And then from there on, we just had to take our time to get on back here. But uh, What was you pulling it with? I was pulling it with a 34 Oldsmobile. It was a, a four-seater, but two-door. It weighed about 2,600 pounds, and the trailer weighed about 2,800 pounds, I think. 2,000 pounds heavier so it, than the car. To slow the thing down, I had to use the trailer brakes. If I tried to use the, the car brakes, it might just whip my car one way or the other. All that weight behind us. I believe it was 3,600 that that trailer weighed. 3,600, wow. we were, we were 2,800, uh, the car. Anyway, well, what, that we, wasn't that car that you were using to pull it with. That wasn't the same one you had before the convertible, was it? No, no, I, the convertible, I got rid of it back when I left Smyrna, way back before I went overseas and everything. But, uh, we brought that uh, Oldsmobile back here, and uh, we'd evidently got the thing hot pulling that trailer at the time and that warped uh, the cylinder head and couldn't keep a gasket on it. We had a lot of trouble with it. And we finally had to get rid of it and, and get something else. We didn't have any money to buy anything. So when I come back here and was running the Hampton Motor and Tractor Company, we also had Pontiac cars that we were brand new that we were selling and getting trade-ins. So I drove trade-ins off of the lot for a year or two before we bought a, another car. Well, getting back to the time that you got made it back to Blue Ridge and you walked into Hampton Motor Company that first day, tell us what happened. <laughs> well, when I walked in, my father-in-law says, well, you're, you're the manager here now, and uh, if you have any problem, I have to holler at me. But uh, it was sink or swim. I was running the thing, and I'd never been in business before in my life. I've been a farm boy all my life. So basically, you walked in, and he walked out. That's right. <laughs> so it was it was an experience and, yeah. and it was very new business only been uh, developed in the last year and a half before I come back here and uh, all of his uh, papers and uh, invoices and sales slips and everything they were just in boxes and I had to get a secretary work for me and start filing all that stuff in the filing cabinets where we could but keep track of now, it. Now, didn't he used to have hardware stores, though, too, before this? Well, he had three hardware stores. So it wasn't that he had never been in business before. He had other hardware stores that he was running. This was just a new type of business. He was yeah. selling uh, mm -hmm. Pontiac cars, International Harvester tractors and equipment, appliances and stuff, too, didn't he? Yes. We had power saws and... Yeah. All kinds of woodworking equipment, and uh, well, we it, it was it was a <laughs> it was kind of a, I had to learn all about all that. I, yeah, well, let's save that for the next time for our next episode, and you can pick up and tell us some of the stories that you uh, had, and I've heard I've heard several of them myself over the years, so you can tell us more about those stories in our next episode. But as always, thanks for watching. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel and catch up on earlier episodes of Thoughts in History from A Centenarian with Del Dyer. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks for watching everyone, and if you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like below and consider supporting our channel by clicking on the subscribe button as well. If you have any questions or suggestions for content, please leave a comment below and we will be sure to read them. And to be notified of any new uploads, turn on notifications at the upper right hand corner of your screen, and we will see you in our next episode.